Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our third session of Memory University 2022. My name is Dr. Sophia Wong. I'm an assistant clinical professor of clinical psychiatry and the Outreach Recruitment Engagement Corps Leader for the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is funded through a grant from the National Institute on Aging. Before we get started, I want to thank uh, the Indiana Geriatric Society for uh, being a sponsor for this CME. Um, their goal is to help optimize uh, care for older adults. And we hope that you will check out their information and learn more about the importance of geriatric medicine. I also want to make sure that you know that this session is being um, uh, rec recorded, but if you're listening to it live, you will be able to get uh, CME uh, credit for this, and so please note the disclosures. So without further ado, I will be moderating, and I'm so glad to have today's guest, Dr. Robert Russell. He's going to be talking about understanding the challenges of delivering Alzheimer's care in minority populations, which is a really huge topic, broadly speaking, but particularly with this COVID-19 pandemic. And Dr. Robert Russell is an MD and MBA. Uh, he specializes in geriatric medicine as well as post-acute uh, care. He got his MD at St. Louis University School of Medicine, and he is also the immediate past president uh, for IMDA and holds a number of really important positions uh, within various nonprofits, including the Executive Board of the Alzheimer's Association of Greater Indiana, and serves as the medical director for Community Care Health Services. And I think we'll really benefit from his insight uh, as a uh, both local and national expert. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Robert Russell. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for coming to today's talk, understanding the challenges of delivering Alzheimer's care in minority populations. My name is Dr. Robert Russell. So financial disclosure, um, I'm a post-acute care specialist, medical director for community care, co-medical director for Kindred Hospice of Avon. I'm also a lead collaborator I'm medical advisor for Eli Lilly and Company, but I have no other financial relevant information to disclose. So the objectives of today's talk are to discuss the brief history of Alzheimer's disease and socially, societally relevant events, to discuss and uh, the difficulty in diagnosing Alzheimer's disease in minorities and the barriers associated with the diagnosis, and to briefly discuss COVID-19 as a barrier, I do know that there will be a, a more substantial talk on COVID-19 next week. So we will just be doing a brief discussion on its relevance to creating barriers for the diagnosis. And we'll also discuss potential solutions to obstacles in diagnosing and ways of improving minority diagnosis rates and access to care. So a little brain teaser. Some of you may know who this is, and I'm not going to say the name just quite yet. Just think about who it may be. And you may also know who this is. And if you said that that was Dr. Alzheimer's and this is his first patient, uh, Mrs. Dieter, you are correct. So between 1901 and 1906, he was treating Ms. Dieter, and he then started to see the significant changes that he started to document in detail. And that's, that was the inception of Alzheimer's disease in 1906. However, it didn't start bearing his name until 1910. But do you know who this is? This is Solomon Carter Fuller. He was a Liberian born neurologist, psychiatrist, pathologist, and a professor at Boston University School of Medicine. He was one of five assistants to Dr. Alzheimer's, and he's noted with making significant contribution to the research of the disease as well. There's also been an effort to make more recognition of his contributions to Alzheimer's disease as of late. In 1968, we had the development of cognitive measurement scales. By 1974, 
we had funding by the National Institute of Aging for Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. But it wasn't until 1976 where Alzheimer's disease was recognized as the most common form of dementia. By 1980, we actually had the founding of the Alzheimer's Association, which helps to provide funding for research as well as support for those who are living with the disease and for caregivers of those uh, taking care of those with the disease. But it wasn't until 1984 until beta amyloid was actually identified. And if you've noticed in the news lately, this is of interest because a lot of the new therapies target beta amyloid as a disease modifying uh, uh, area of treatment and therapy. So depending on what you look at, you may see Alzheimer's disease as the number six leading cause of death or the number seven. For the pandemic, it moves down to about the number seven cause of death of all cause uh, mortality. Now, I gave you some brief history of Alzheimer's disease to also give you a frame of reference for some of the things that we're gonna talk about now. Particularly the Tuskegee experiment, which you can see on the left, and juxtaposed against Henrietta Lacks, which you see on the right. The Tuskegee experiment actually started in 1932 and did not end till 1972. So it's only 50 years ago. And Henrietta Lacks' family was not notified that her cells, which were obtained without her family's consent in 1951, they were not notified until 1975 that those cells were still being used for uh, groundbreaking research. That's only 47 years ago. So as Alzheimer's disease was being flushed out and further research was being done and some things, even some of the biomarkers were being developed, African-Americans were being actively researched on. The Tuskegee experiment was actually a government funded experiment looking at syphilis and untreating black males even though there was knowledge that penicillin could actually cure the disease. And I had mentioned the Lacks family was not notified till 1975 of the use of their ancestors' cells until uh, in which they did not consent to at the time for them to even be harvested. Another point is that at one point in time, there were 500 African-American owned and operated hospitals across the country. Now there's only one, Howard University in Washington, DC. So in about less than eight years, we could see almost a doubling of Alzheimer's cases in minority populations from pre-pandemic numbers of 2.7 million to 6.9 million by 2030. And it's the fourth leading cause of death in African-Americans. But despite this knowledge of this being uh, a, a disease that affects African-Americans in such a, a tremendous way, there's still a lot of lag in the diagnosis of the disease for the population, which leads also to families not being able to take use of therapies in a timely fashion, nor can they prepare for the inception of the disease as it continues to progress. For Hispanics, they are one and a half times more likely than whites to have the disease, but they're still less likely to receive the diagnosis. It is also known that in Hispanic populations, they may show signs of the disease 6.8 years earlier than their white counterparts. However, Th this may be an underestimate because there's a thought that in by 2050, there'll be a six fold increase in the number of Hispanics with the disease. Why this may be kind of uh, erroneous data is because we also know that there are a large number of undocumented immigrants that do not seek medical treatment and also uh, fail to see a provider on a consistent basis, which may also lead to them not being diagnosed. So we know that African-Americans are hit harder by the disease. 
We know that they have a two time uh, more likelihood of developing the disease in whites, which also culminates in first degree relatives having a 43.7% higher cumulative risk and their spouses having an 18.4% higher cumulative risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So what are some of the challenges to making a diagnosis? Well, part of it is the doctor's willingness to actually make the diagnosis. And we'll discuss this here in detail in just a second. There's still the trust in the medical system, which I've pointed out in the fact that the Tuskegee experiment is only about 50 years old. There are relatives who are uh, participants of the experiments who have firsthand accountings of how that experiment went. And also it was 1960, I'm sorry, 1975, when the Lacks family was just being notified of the still use of their ancestor cells, which they're still trying to fight for justice for recognition today. And then there's access to research centers and increased participation of minorities in research that is lagging and makes it challenging for making a diagnosis. So what do doctors say? Well, a doctor is more likely to tell you have cancer than to tell you you have dementia. So this is March, 2015, where 45% of Medicare patients were informed by their doctor of their diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease versus 90% of Medicare patients were, uh, were informed of their diagnosis of cancer. This also hits their loved ones and caregivers because only 53% of them are informed if their loved one has dementia as well. So even those caring for patients who may know something is wrong and may know that their loved one needs help may be left in the dark of what the true diagnosis for what's going on with them is at the time of them seeking help. And also there's only about 5% of African-Americans that are represented in clinical trials. And we've already talked about some of these issues because of the lack of, of trust in the health system, the disbelief that the information and the data will actually be used in a way that will be meaningful for the community. And also that there will be follow-up when that data is made available and is collected that the researchers just won't leave the community and not return to give them some insightful information about what they actually have been able to uh, ascertain from the information that they've gathered. This was in December 16th of 2020, and this is from the National Institute of Aging, where despite participating in the same research and despite there being knowledge that African-Americans and Blacks have a two-time uh, higher likelihood of having dementia, they were 35% less likely to receive the diagnosis versus their white counterparts. So this brings us to this information, which I have to thank one of my colleagues at AMDA for providing for us today, Dr. Cepeda. It shows that there is a con continued disparity in uh, race and ethnicity when it comes to chronic disease and that chronic disease management as far as patients are concerned. And you can see the data here that for Blacks, they're about 10.7% less likely to be to receive the care as well as the treatments for their chronic diseases than other ethnicities. For Hispanics, we know that this group may also seek less care, and this is also based on census data, because of a lot of misconceptions about how this information may be used. If they're undocumented, there's a fear that there'll be reprisal, deportation, and if they have family members that are undocumented, they also feel this may lead to um, adverse events for their family members. So a lot of times, even when they can ascertain insurance, even as an undocumented worker, they don't always seek preventative care 
they will utilize emergency rooms and urgent cares with a, a higher likelihood than seeing a consistent medical provider for fear that there could be some type of legal or government action done. Then there's also this the inherent language barrier. There's still a lack of translational services that are available at all times as well as materials that can be presented in a bilingual fashion, which also leads to an inherent barrier when dealing with people of uh, non-speaking language origin. So even when seeing a doctor and participating in research, we're still seeing that African-Americans are not being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And this was highlighted in continued mistrust during the pandemic and COVID-19, where there was a huge amount of vaccine hesitancy. So a lot of the issues that surround just things that have happened 50 and 47 years ago still permeate in the African-American and minority communities. Now, these are more nationally known incidents, but there are some stories and details of incidents like these happening in many major cities that a lot of African-Americans still talk about and deal with uh, today. So as we showed, even though this data shows here that African-Americans were more likely to be hospitalized along with their Hispanic uh, uh, minority brethren, but there still was hesitancy in both of those categories in receiving the vaccination. Even though they we led the nation in the number of deaths as well, still there was large hesitancy revolving getting vaccinated. So a lot of people think that technology will be the key to also uh, kind of erasing some of these gaps. However, we're starting to see that technology is also starting to be another barrier. Even when telemedicine was becoming more readily available, it was becoming significantly apparent that a lot of non-speaking whites, non-English speaking whites, as well as Hispanics and African-Americans were less likely to use telemedicine. Also, you may think AI and machine learning may be the key in the future, but we're starting to see that there's disparities that are starting to be formed with this as well, as many of the algorithms that are used for diagnosis and treatment fail to recognize a lot of communities of color, therefore leaving out a vast majority of patients who need access and um, also need therapy and treatment for their disorders. So as I talked to you about the previous study, it was found that for non-speaking English people, that was about 16% less likely to utilize telemedicine. And for people using Medicaid, there were about 7% to successfully conduct a telemedicine visit. So as we are looking at healthcare and social determinants of health, we have to look at what are those drivers. And as a lot of health systems are trying to build in ways to eliminate the barriers of social determinants of health, even here, you see a, a, a somewhat overview of all of the things that would be necessary to provide an equitable health system. So until providers and researchers not only understand the things that can impact social determinants of health, they also have to uh, they also have to become knowledgeable of the cultural nuances, cultural norms, and language barriers that also make social determinants of health even more prevalent in many communities. And then the elephant in the room is just bias. Um, these are all of the various biases there are, whether it be ageism, racial, whether it be confirmation or gender, a lot of these biases also add to barriers in delivering adequate care for minority populations, particularly when dealing with dementia and dementia related issues. So if you look at the data we talked about earlier, particularly the study where African-Americans that we know have a two time, 
a twofold more likelihood of having a dementia, but what but yet we're still 35% less likely to receive the diagnosis, it kind of comes into the form of one of these biases, particularly maybe an unconscious bias or sometimes even an implicit bias that leads to people not to think a certain community or a certain race falls into a certain category. So when you have these implicit biases, this could lead to an extreme barrier in, and also perpetuate mistrust with the health system. So how do we overcome these obstacles? Physicians and researchers have to acknowledge past events and address African-American concerns. They have to be knowledgeable, particularly if they're in a certain city or community of the events that may have taken place that may lead to the continued mistrust of a certain health system or to um, the health system in general across the board in a city. Knowledgeable of the national issues, including Tuskegee and, and the events of Henrietta Lacks, are important because those are going to be pointed out and being able to speak to them in a way about the things that have been implemented to allow physicians to not hopefully continue to perpetuate some of the things that have happened in the past, help to ease the kind of mistrust that is built up over years for these events that have transpired. Also, researchers have to be willing to stay connected to communities. Even as the research is coming to an end or even as the research has, has completed, this allows communities to feel like that what they did was meaningful and that they're still part of the, the overall solution, even if there was no actual solution that came out of the data. And in Hispanic and Latino communities, we have to be able to alleviate their fears. We have to inform them of how the information is gonna be used, but we also have to inform them of how we are going to protect that information so that there's not consequences for themselves or for their family members. We definitely have to do a better job of making sure that we're being bi-directional and multilingual in our offerings when going to do research as well having translational services, having members of the team that represent the community, but also having materials that speak to what you're trying to achieve in a way that's understandable for the community will also be extremely important in overcoming some of these obstacles. So providers have to improve their overall diagnosis rates across the board. As we saw, they were more willing to tell patients they had cancer than they were dementia. Now, some of this is perpetuated by the thought that I really don't have anything to offer them and there's no treatments, but as we see with some of the new emerging medications, that may not be the case. And there's a lot of emphasis on families now who say they wanna know so they can prepare and they can actually make plans for the future as the disease progresses. Providers also have to understand the, the cultural norms that may normalize dementia. A lot of communities insulate their elderly population in some instances. So understanding the cultural norms, understanding the language barriers, that may also make it difficult for them to understand what the science is saying about the cognitive issue also helps to uh, allow providers to be more engaged and help to provide that diagnosis. And as we keep, uh, as I keep reiterating, being knowledgeable of past transgressions and actually just making sure that people understand at least you are educated on the issues that they're concerned about and you're willing to speak to them and not just set them aside as something that happened in the past. Some of these people, some of these communities have uh, patients and family members who are so not so far removed from these experiments that happened under government sanction. So as we see with vaccine hesitancy, there's a, a 
and there's an inherent distrust of something that the government is saying that is good when just 50 years ago, there was something that the government had offered that had very negative outcomes. So being able to speak to this and being able to speak to some of the changes that have been made are very important in moving the, the diagnosis forward and also moving providers into a more of a collaborative arrangement with these communities as well. And we just have to overall continue to improve access to healthcare for all. So if we are gonna use technology, we have to make sure that we're allowing people to have access to technology. We have to make sure people have Wi-Fi. We have to make sure that people have adequate electronics that can interface with health systems instead of just rolling out these new initiatives and not making sure that our patient population will be able to access them in times of convenience. In closing, the challenge of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease in minority populations are rooted in the need for healthcare work, healthcare to work harder to understand the population they serve. At this point of emphasis, we are we are working to incorporate social determinants of health into the conversation regarding health outcomes. However, we have to make sure that we're also incorporating cultural norms, language barriers, and other cultural nuances that need to be highlighted in order to impact social determinants of health. We have to be able to have bi-directional dialogues with communities and offer better transparency to how this information is collected and what we will be doing with this information. I would like to thank the, the Memory University for allowing me to give this talk today. It is such a relevant talk as we sit on the eve of Juneteenth and now I will open the floor for any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, I really like to thank everyone for sitting in on this wonderful talk with Dr. Robert Russell. Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Russell now to uh, join us for a live Q and A. Um, we have a lot of really exciting questions, so uh, let me get started um, in just a moment. Um, Dr. Russell, are you able to turn on your camera here to join us? <clears throat> I can't turn the camera on quite yet. I'm not oh, sure. Okay, technical be... difficulty. Um, yeah. Do you want to actually maybe just go ahead and maybe I'll start to read some questions uh, to you, and you can go ahead and start answering them because there's a lot of uh, great questions in the chat. So yeah, it's saying the host has to allow me to turn the camera on. So oh, okay. There we are. Oh, there we are. Okay, great. Yeah. So I think the first question, and you went in, uh, you went into this a little bit. Um, but you're, uh, the first question is, why are physicians and other healthcare professionals not willing to diagnose dementia or share the diagnosis of dementia? Well, that's a great question. And, and it really boils down to, as I started to uh, elucidate in the talk, is a feeling that there's not much to offer when a diagnosis is given, particularly in the form of treatment. Also, the fear of wait, what may happen to the patient once they have that information. Unfortunately, particularly in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of more emphasis on trying to get the diagnosis early. What I did see before 10 years prior were a lot of people withheld that diagnosis because it could have implications on their work life. It could have implication on their social life. So they really kept that diagnosis sometimes to themselves, sometimes between them and the patient, not really giving them the diagnosis, but saying you're aging, you're getting older, you're showing some cognitive issues, but it's nothing to worry about. So it became more of an issue. Uh, and like I said, the lack of having any definitive treatments also led a lot of physicians to feel like, well, I really don't have much to offer at this point until it does progress to a stage where it becomes um, more of a concern. So that has led to a lot of hesitancy in many communities of trying to get that diagnosis from their physician population. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're definitely, at least from my perspective as a practicing clinician, seeing the field really evolve and being able just to talk, that stigma is dropping, but it, it's still there. I think for good or for ill, I think we'll both have to agree that Adikanibab, no matter what anybody may think about the data, has really forced the conversation forward. I, I've gotten a huge influx now of referrals asking, you know, do I have Alzheimer's? Um, and I don't know if you've seen a similar, you know, uptick. I know you do more um, post-acute care uh, rather than outpatient. But I'm just wondering, you know, as we kind of brainstorm here, are you getting a, a lot of questions now from your colleagues about, um, you know, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, being able to talk about it earlier? Yeah, I, I actually definitely do think people uh, do think people want to know now. People yeah. do want to know, particularly if they have uh, at any direct connection to relatives who have shown signs of the disease or have been caregivers themselves of a loved one who's had the disease. A lot more people want to know now. A lot more people want to know what they can do for preventative measures to try to hopefully prevent them from developing the disease. So there is a lot more interest in trying to get that diagnosis early and trying to improve their cognitive health early. Yeah. And in terms of uh, just taking a step back though, you know, on one hand, we're on the verge of so many, you know, I think a, a real revolution um, about, um, you know, with Alzheimer's uh, disease modifying drugs, right? Um, but then on the other hand, I worry, you know, and we're both subspecialists, you're a geri geriatric medicine physician, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, um, the level of access to subspecialty care, right? We know that early detection, though we're going to be, uh, you and I, we continue to work together to advocate for that early detection. That really happens in primary care, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, where that should be happening. And it doesn't happen as much as we would like, right? So it's happening with subspecialists like us. Can you sort of comment on what your understanding is in terms of Blacks, Hispanics, being able to advocate for themselves to get those subspecialty referrals, um, being able to have meaningful dialogues about, um, you know, disease modifying medications like aducanumab. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a great question. And that's also some great relevant points. I, I think in advocacy, if there's a concern, if like anything else, you really have to question and collaborate with your primary care doctor on what those concerns are and what's going to be the best avenue of trying to alleviate those concerns. So if you're seeing that you're having cognitive issues or you're seeing that your loved one is having cognitive issues, Blacks and Hispanics in those communities have to feel empowered to have those conversations with their, with their um, providers. And really say, if you can't help me with this, can you point me in the direction of someone who can? Particularly in the area of research, are there research trials, are there research studies? Or who are the specialists like you or I in an area that may be able to speak to my concerns? A lot of times that's where it initially starts. It initially starts with the primary care doctor taking time out to listen to what that concern is. And like you said, they may not be the one that is able to make that diagnosis, but really trying to get them to someone who can whether it be through the, neuro, the, the Stark Neuroscience Center, whether it be through um, you know, the Alzheimer's Center at IU or uh, the, the Geriatric uh, Neuro uh, Psychology Center at St. Vincent, there's a lot of avenues that you can get the diagnosis. It's just getting to them. And it will start with them having to really ask for that assistance in getting to one of those areas where the diagnosis could potentially be made. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And what do you, what, how do you handle, how would you say, suggest to a family member or a friend, if they feel like they're not getting the quality of care that they deserve, if they're concerned about experiencing discrimination, what are some, what are some recourses that you suggest? Sure. And that's a, that's a really tough question because there are oftentimes that people, regardless of race, don't feel heard. Um, it may feel more significant if you're an African-American or Hispanic dealing with an issue and you're going to a provider that may or may not look like you and you feel like you're not being heard. And I think that's where you have to have just a meaningful connection at that point to say to that provider, 
I'm not sure if you're understanding what my concerns are. Maybe I need to rephrase it or maybe I need to say it to you in another way. And can you please help me understand if you truly understand what I'm trying to say to you? And that's when hopefully the dialogue will open up. I often tell patients, if you feel like you're not being heard, it's important for you to talk to that provider in a very uh, frank and and very um, cordial way of, hey, I really want to make sure you're understanding what my needs are. And I want to see if you understand what I'm really trying to relay to you. And if that then is still an issue, then it may be it may be time to seek another provider if that's the case, if you still don't feel like your needs are being addressed. But I think that's where building out the patient physician relationship. And as I talked about in the talk, it has to be bi-directional. Um, you're also dealing with some people, particularly in certain age categories that are used to this being a one directional relationship. They go to the doctor, the doctor tells them what they need to do and tells them everything and they just ingest it and do it. And sometimes their concerns aren't met that way. However, for, for these type of trans, um, these type of conversations, they have to be bi-directional. And even when dealing with older individuals, you have to allow them the space to feel comfortable saying what their concerns are so you can try to appropriately address them. Okay. I, I think those are all really great points. Um, I think other points that I often share um, is that, you know, I, I say, you know, I tell people, like, you can tell your primary care doctor, I really value your initial opinion. However, I'm wondering if you would feel comfortable you know, referring me to such and such to get a second opinion, you know, I, I would just like to have, you know, someone's other thought process on this to help me better understand what's going on. And that's, that's a term that I've, a phrase I've kind of suggested people use so that we don't alienate your primary care doctor exactly. at the same time. It's, I think it's perfectly fine getting a second opinion. And I always tell people that if I see all kinds of complicated cases and I'm not afraid to tell people sometimes like, this is really complicated. It'd be good to get a second opinion actually, not because I think my opinion's invalid, but because sometimes different people bring different thoughts to the table and you deserve the best possible evaluation and management of your complex situation. I think that's, that's perfectly, um, I, don't, I don't feel any good uh, healthcare professional should feel defensive when somebody wants a second opinion um, or somebody's asking for a second opinion. Um, somebody's asking whether you want to make your slides available. Uh, this recording will certainly be available. Um, and if Dr. Russell, if you do yeah. want to make your slides available, we, we would be grateful, but not required. Sure. So I think another question, a theme that I'm, I'm seeing coming up is, you know, the question of cultural bias and accurate diagnosis. Um, so I feel again, compelled to weigh in. Um, You've seen it, I've seen it. Um, I think probably the biggest one that comes to mind, unfortunately, is psychotic symptoms uh, in which somebody's hearing or seeing things. Um, we just know statistically speaking that uh, minorities, particularly blacks, particularly uh, men are much more likely to get drug tested. Um, and those symptoms are often attributed to substance use, even when those drug tests are negative. They're like, well, it was negative, but we still think it's alcohol or something else. Turns out it's actually beginning of psychosis, Lewy body dementia. Um, what do you, how, how do you handle that? You know, when you're say seeing someone for a second opinion and you think in your mind, geez, there was a misdiagnosis. I'm concerned that race played a bias in that. Do you like, you know, as you discuss like that second opinion diagnosis, do you openly bring up the role um, as an African American, you know, provider? Do you do you openly say? Do you openly talk to your patients about that? Um, is it on a case case basis? How do you discuss racism if some, you think someone that you're seeing has experienced that? That that's a great question. It's also a a tough tough question. So it really, if I really have a strong feeling that race played an issue, that's when the discussion is had. Because like you said, there's the cultural bias and then there's the unconscious bias. And I think sometimes it's, there are instances where it's directly 
evident that there was a bias at place at play and and that led to the misdiagnosis because they wanted to keep with that bias and that permeated throughout the whole process but then you see a lot of times there's the unconscious and some of the things that are just permeating in society that continue to perpetuate a bias and those i i talked to him about it but those are a little harder to pinpoint down that it was definitely race in uh, initiated bias you know there's there's just stereotypical behavior that you know uh, all of us can be guilty of that may lead to a certain outcome now i think what we're seeing particularly as providers we're seeing that the thought process that providers are immune to that is finally being broken down that providers are immune to actually having those biases play out into how they actually treat or diagnose patients we're now starting to see well have great data even with some of the terminology used per patient that is different for the same type of treatments or the same type of disorders where there obviously was a bias that led to this term being put in someone's chart i.e. non-compliance versus someone putting in someone else chart they are declining something that's a softer term if someone declines a treatment it says oh well we can reintroduce this in the future if someone is non-compliant that becomes a stigma that oh this person is not willing to go along with what we're suggesting so those things are definitely evident and i do talk to patients about that all the time that you know was it that you really did not want to go with the treatment plan or you just wanted to continue the dialogue wanted to learn a little bit more wanted to have an open discussion and you just wanted to wait and talk about it some more. And a lot of times that's what it is. It's not that the patient is trying to be non-compliant, it's that the patient really just needs more reassurance, needs more education, and also needs to have that open in a dialogue. So, yes, I I think it's a difficult conversation to have, but I try to err on the side of trying to figure out how intense the bias is or how intentful the bias was before just blatantly telling the patient, oh, I think your last provider was racially biased against you. Because it, unfortunately, it is a case-by-case basis in a lot of instances. Yeah, no, I, I think those are all great points. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I, I do, you know, as you said, there's, it's, it's rare that I see explicit bias um, especially, you know, I think with more um, cultural sensitivity training, certainly unconscious bias is something that everybody struggles with. Um, all of us are just human. I think one of the things, and, and I'd be curious that I try to make sure to do is I do try to educate patients and the family members about, about symptoms. You know, so for example, educating them that these psychotic symptoms, you know, are not related, you know, to X, but they are part of the disease process. Um, And I think the good or bad news is that we can now tag providers and we can kind of signal to them, hey, you know, like you said this was marijuana, but they actually stopped the marijuana for six months. I've got an objective urine toxicology showing that it's gone. It's out of their system. Um, You know, they're still having psychotic symptoms. This is why I think it's Lewy body dementia. Otherwise, I agree. There's always this like taint of, oh, it's drugs or, oh, it's alcohol. And we could go down the list of things. But it's really great to hear how you're handling this because you're really on the front lines, both as, you know, somebody who is in a population being biased against, but also can see the other side as a provider. So I think a lot of other really great questions. I don't know if we'll get to all of them. But I think another one that's come up is, you know, what are your thoughts on the etiology on the higher incidence of uh, dementia um, in minorities? Why do you think that is? Okay, so that's a great question. I actually saw it in the chat. I was hoping we did get to that one. Um, the the incident uh, rates being higher in a minority population are sometimes related to environmental factors particularly people who live in high lead level areas, there's uh, documented data to that, particularly people who live in uh, higher 
uh, areas where there are higher areas of chemical uh, environmental factors around steel mills. Uh, you think about the, the people that used to work in these industries, a lot of times after a while it became African Americans and minorities who were laborers in a lot of these industries. And as these industries left, they also became occupants of those areas. And if there wasn't, a, it, there wasn't great environmental cleanup, those things also come into play. Then you just have the environmental factors or you have someone mentioned and, and brought this question up. African-Americans suffer from diabetes at higher rates. African-Americans suffer from hypertension at higher rates, which lead to other vascular abnormalities, which then can potentiate higher rates of dementia, um, whether it be via stroke or whether it be just from other pathophysiological factors that lead them to having higher rates of dementia. And that gets back to, and someone brought this up in uh, one of the questions as well, where the overall diet comes into play. Um, lifestyle definitely comes into play. Uh, we have great data that shows that uh, Mediterranean lifestyles, lifestyles higher in omega-3, also active lifestyles tend to help in preventative measures. Um, if you live in an environment that is unfortunately not a safe place to walk outside, you're not going to walk outside, so that's going to negate one of the play, one of the things you can do as a health uh, preventative measure, as a natural health thing that you can do to prevent you from progressing to a certain uh, disease process. Um, if your if your neighborhood's not safe, if your neighborhood's in a food desert where you're relying on very tertiary sources of where you can get nutritional food from you may have more fat, fast food options, more um, gas station food op options than you actually have for a uh, actual grocery store where you can get um, adequate fresh produce and things of that nature. So there are a lot of environmental factors that, play, uh, that fall into the category of why that is. Then you have a lot of the just uh, leading medical factors that lead you to dementia that unfortunately the African-American community suffers from. So those lead you to why the incidents are higher in that community. This is very much highlighted in the disparities we saw during the pandemic. That was why some of the leading factors that led to the disproportionality of the outcomes for African Americans and even some Hispanics was pointed out. It actually had to make us look at why is this happening? It actually had to make us look at the rates of these things again. And these are things that we've known for now a decade that are still issues that now we are trying to uh, mitigate in some way. But these are the issues that lead us to having higher incidence of dementia. I think this is really insightful. And I, I think I just want to add from my perspective, what I think is so fascinating and maybe the basis for a future talk is that the epidemiologic studies do suggest that actually in sub-Sahara, I mean, sorry, in the continent of Africa, it actually has one of the lowest incidence rates of dementia, right? So, you know, people asking about this is genetics, environment, I think it's very fascinating that that environment probably plays a bigger role, but I don't think it's the entire answer. I think you and I have talked about that complex genetic environment interaction. We also know that genes over you know, many generations, epigenetic changes can be transmitted. So what did happen to your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, you know, really does make a difference over many years of you know, uh, you know, of what happened with, with slavery and everything. So those things do have, we think, actual genetic changes. We've seen it with Holocaust survivors as well with the transmission of epigenetic changes with PTSD. So I think a lot of work remains to be done. And I think there was just another recent study that came out with regards to Hispanics. They're actually looking at, um, I think, Brazilian uh, Amazon tribes. And so uh, these are actually low income, but very good lifestyle, very healthy lifestyle, very active, uh, very healthy diet. And they have one of the lowest incident rates of, of dementia. So I think it's really amazing that um, environment plays a role. And, and, you know, with regards to the racial disparities, I think it's very stark that, you know, when we had the recent Omicron surge, as you know, 
and, and many folks know, this all started in South Africa, right? The impact we thought was quite mild. And yet, you know, you saw, I think probably more so than anybody else, that the Omicron surge, though people kept on saying it was mild, there were more Americans who died, particularly Blacks, in that Omicron surge. And mm. so this is a really great challenge that, you know, you take what is pretty genetically pretty much the same virus, you know, transmit it very quickly, you know, across the ocean, we see totally different effects. And I'll, I'll be... I think it'll be important to see what the science shows in terms of the impact, you know, cognitively and, and in other ways physically, because we know that COVID also affects the lungs and the heart long term mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if there's anything you want to add about that, you know, this, the huge disparities in what we know biologically are the same agents, but on different continents having very different outcomes. Yeah, and I think that speaks to also the changes, uh, the Western diet versus uh, diet in other areas as well, uh, lifestyle um, in those areas. And I think uh, the data that I showed that like the 43.7% first relative having a uh, cumulative risk of developing Alzheimer's um, from that, that just being, like you said, there's got to be some genetic inherent transmission that leading to that, whether it be that they have higher incidence of diabetes from their genetic pool or hypertension from their genetic pool, it's still leading them down a path to having dementia as well. It will be interesting to see as we're continuing to analyze this data um, over the next few years and looking at us still having to deal with COVID, how this does impact societies and cultures as we're going forward too. Um, who is still being most impacted by COVID and what are the long-term ramifications of that? Will that lead the people, particularly in African-Americans and Hispanic communities who had some of the higher rates of COVID, will we see early onset dementia? Will we see, uh, you know, dementia and, and, and larger waves in those populations because of the, and the continued factors that COVID may play? So there is a, uh, there will be a lot of interest in this. And I think wrapping it back to what we're trying to do as a, as a, um, as health systems and providers are trying to do at really being more cognizant of social determinants of health, it may start making us look with a more discerning eye at how we can help those individuals with those, with those environmental problems that they face. Okay, well, I think that's great. Um, a couple of things coming up in the chat. I'd love to hear how you explain this to patients and their families. What's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Can you use these terms back and forth, you know, and how are they different? Sure. So Alzheimer's is just one form of dementia. There are several types of dementia where it, there is vascular dementia. You heard uh, Dr. Uh, Sophia talk about uh, Lewy body dementia in a patient. So there, there's frontal temporal dementia. There's dementia that is derived from Parkinson's disease. There's, there's so many different forms. Alzheimer's, as you saw in the data that I presented in 1976, became the most recognized one. And just by virtue became the one that almost became synonymous for dementia overall. However, it's only one type of dementia, actually. It is considered the most prevalent dementia. However, there are several different types. And there are what we consider some reversible dementias. Um, and I saw in the chat that people were mentioning diabetes, particularly type 3 diabetes as a dementia. You can have reversible cognitive deficits from uncontrolled diabetes. Once you get the diabetes controls, those cognitive deficits will then reverse. There are, there are vitamins that can uh, be deficient that can cause cognitive changes. And once you replete those vitamin stores, those cognitive changes are now, should uh, uh, reverse themselves. And if you're having thyroid issues and your thyroid is being now properly managed, any cognitive issues related to the thyroid may also then reverse itself. And then there's just certain things that can happen virally and um, during periods of time, sometimes that's confused with encephalopathy, but sometimes also it's, it's a confusing form of dementia and it or cognitive deficits that are reversed once the infection is now under control. So 
the, 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 the short answer is Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia. And most providers, unfortunately, still use that as the blanket term for all dementias. But dementia should be the leading term. And then providers should be working to specify what type of dementia you have. And I think it just has become easy for providers to say you either have Alzheimer's or you got dementia. Mm -hmm. And you, you, and it's, it's just easy to say it that way. And it gets a little more intricate when you have to actually say you have vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia. And that gets back to sending you to a specialist that may be able to help help you discern the exact type of dementia that uh, you may be that your loved one may have. Yeah, I think that's going to be really important. And I, I'd love to invite you back again, Dr. Russell, because we do know that uh, minorities, uh, Blacks and African-Americans, Hispanics are much more likely to have these multifactorial dementias. We actually think it's one of the reasons that, you know, um, they may end up having different drug responses. So this is not just some theoretical construct. This is an idea the complexity of dementia being different and racial and ethnic minorities could actually make a difference. There's so many questions in the chat. I don't think we're gonna to get to all of them, but actually the last question I, I just wanted to pitch out, it's not exactly dementia related, but I, I think it's a great question is, why do they actually select Henrietta Lack uh, for cell studies? I don't know if you know the answer to it. I'm happy to share my viewpoint, but I, I just be curious. I, I think that's actually a great question. It wasn't, it wasn't because she was African-American though. I can tell you that. Much. No, so. no, it, it, it actually was not because she was African-American. It was because they couldn't kill them. They, they, they are called the immortal cells for a reason. Um, they did various experiments on these cells and these cells were, they, they just are become so, um, I guess, I, I, for lack of a better word, they're, they're just so robust and they're so genetically uh, perfect for research that they, they harvested them because of that alone. It was from the initial pathology. She suffered from cervical cancer. It was from the initial pathology of the cervical cancer that these cells continue to proliferate. And, yeah. and, they're, and they're continually to proliferate in perpetuity. They're perpetually proliferating. So they, that's why they got the term the immortal cell because of that. And that's what has led to them being so widely used in research around this world because of how many things you can test knowing that this cell line is going to continue to proliferate gives you such a research. It does give you such a research advantage. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it was the way they were ascertained and the lack of transparency that has led it to being a uh, definitely a controversial thing um, in the sense of where we take science and how science is derived. So, but the cells themselves are, they're, they're, they're just a, a genetically perfect line of cells, particularly for research. Yeah, it, it's really a fascinating story. There's actually a book about this, mm -hmm. um, but the genetic, uh, sorry, the gynecologist, uh, the uh, surgeon who removed the cells, he had actually tried this on a number of other patients of all different races. And mm -hmm. as you pointed out, um, Robert, that, that when they tried to culture them, they only could keep them alive uh, for a few rounds. So basically when cells reproduce, you try to continue to harvest and grow them, basically try to continue on with generations. And most of them died after like, you know, essentially after grandkids, but now essentially nobody's using the original cells that were cultured. Those have been proliferated on, we're probably on generation, I don't know, yeah. 1,000 at this point. Yeah. Um, and what we now know epidemiologically, as you know, quite well is that for whatever reason, tragically, um, African-American women do get cervical cancer younger. They're much more malignant. Yep. And yep. that's what we really saw was this uh, really sort of very tragically a malignancy that killed a very young, otherwise healthy, you know, African-American woman. And that really reflects the epidemiology, uh, epidemiology that we see now. Yeah. Um, but that was I'll, not selected because of her race. It just no. Happened. But I will add to the point. She's a good example of being marginalized because she knew something was wrong. She actually found the mass in her body herself, mm 
and try to get attention for that. Um, you know, that was unfortunately in the 1950s where she was going with a complaint. And it also was during a period of time where women had less say, as we're looking at this today, um, where her husband had a lot of say about whether she was going to be treated or not. She didn't even have the right at that time to advocate for herself for treatment. It was up to her husband at the time. So it's a, it's a very fascinating story all around. Yeah. And I think um, we do need to wrap up. It's probably a future discussion, but a huge wrinkle has arisen because um, what led to the controversy and rediscovery uh, was when they wanted to actually print the genetic sequencing of this publicly to try to figure out this very answer. And um, that led to a huge controversy that we can perhaps dis discuss on another day. Um, and that is protecting genetic privacy, particularly in racial and ethnic minorities in terms of what we can do with Alzheimer's research. So I wanna stop now. Um, we are past our time, but I wanna thank everybody who stayed on and we hope to welcome you back for a future talk, Dr. Russell. It was a great pleasure to have you. Please, I would, right. I would love to come back. Thank you. All right, please stay on for our final uh, slide and we will see you next week. I want to thank everyone for attending today's uh, webinar. I really also want to thank Dr. Robert Russell for being our guest speaker. Your feedback is very important to us. Please take a few minutes to give us your thoughts uh, when we send you the survey link. And please stay in touch with the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. You can send us an email with your thoughts and questions. You can also give us a call. We also check out our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'd uh, like to also welcome you to join us next week when we have our final talk on Friday, June 24th. I'll be speaking about long haulers um, and the uh, consequences on cognition from COVID-19 infection. And if you didn't have a chance to listen to our previous three talks or you wanna to listen to them again with Dr. Dage about uh, blood biomarkers for Alzheimer's, Ms. Anita Hardin, JD, about common misconceptions about powers of attorney um, or Dr. Robert Russell's talk, please check out our Facebook. So that way you can listen to these talks at your leisure or share them with your friends. Once again, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you for our final talk. <laughs>